Um, welcome, everyone. I, um, my name is Cody Price, and I just want to welcome you to the webcast. Sorry for the bit of d delay, um, but we will now begin shortly. Um, today, on March 11th, we will have a presentation on urban retail given by um, Terry Olsenheimer and Jill Griffin. For help during today's webcast, please feel free to type your questions in the chat box found in the webinar toolbar to the right of your screen or call 1-800-263-6317. For content questions, please feel free to type those in the questions box, and we'll be able to answer those at the end of the presentation during the question and answer sessions. Here's a list of our participating chapters, divisions, and universities, and I would like to send out a personal thank you to the Economic Development Division for sponsoring today's webcast. Here's a list of our upcoming webcasts. As you can see, our next one will be on March 18th with the special assessments, must create special benefits and how to avoid an unconstitutional taking. Um, then we'll have another one on March 25th, and then we'll start our April um, webinar series. Um, you can find a complete listing of our 2011 webcasts and register for those at www.utah-apa.org slash webcasts. This is underneath a... Um, new website, so before it was always .htm at the end, but now you don't need that anymore, and so if you were having trouble with that, um, you just need to have this um, web address. Um, for a, After the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be able to log your CM credits by going to www.planning.org slash CM, select activities by day, and then select today's date, um, March 11th, and then under that you'll see urban retail, and like I said, this is up. Um, right now, so after today's session, you can go ahead and log that. And we'll also be, um, we are recording today's session, and so you'll be able to find a PDF and a video recording um, of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast um, dash archive. And again, this is a new um, web address. You can find it, uh, a link to the um, webcast archive on the when you go to log for when you go to register for new webinars so you can just follow that or you can type in this address and this should be up by Monday um, right now I'd like to um, introduce today's speakers so Terry um, Olsenheimer FAICP is the director of Arlington Economic Development he previously was the director of um, Loudoun County Economic Development Development and Field Director at the National League of Cities. He holds his PhD in Public Policy from George Mason University and received his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from the University of Florida. Jill Griffin um, is a planner for the Arlington Economic Development. She previously worked as a planner for the Arlington County Planning Division in the city of Ashland, Virginia. She has her Bachelor of Arts and Masters of Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Virginia. All right, I'm Terry Holtheimer. Good afternoon. Um, trying to trying to change the slide here. I'll say a few things about uh, the Economic Development Division. Uh, Bob Lewis was going to join us. Uh, I'm a former chair of the Economic Development Division, and I'm currently chair of the Division's Council of APA. Uh, and we're very very pleased to have the division uh, actively participate in the webinar series. I would encourage any of you who are interested in economic development to join the Economic Development uh, Division of APA. Uh, it's very easy to do. You can go on to uh, uh, planning.org, go to divisions, and then just click uh, join a division and pick the division of your choice. Uh, there's 21 to choose from. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, we are the content part of APA, so we'll give you, uh, give you good information, I think. This comes out of uh, a, a request uh, partly from the survey that the Economic Development Division did uh, about a year ago that Bob uh, Lewis had conducted, which is what the people in the division want. And they wanted really practical information. They wanted some case studies, and they wanted things that were um, not only thought-provoking, but, but actually kind of the best practices. And, and I, think we're, I think we're there, at least we're trying to be there. Uh, Jill and I both work for Arlington, Virginia, uh, and we have been doing uh, some work on urban retail for a while, uh, and and today we're going to answer some of the questions. What what is urban retail? Uh, and then we're going to look at the Arlington context 
because it's really hard to give general information that's not uh, with, with no context provided. So we're going to give you the information about what we're doing in, in the context that we have. But I think most of it is generalizable to other other uh, communities, especially the work that Jill is doing. Um, so we're going to talk about a, uh, some background work that we did called Room for Improvement uh, as it related to our retail uh, environment. We're going in to do a study called Boutiques, Bistros, and Banks to really look at what is successful retail. And then uh, as good planners, we have, of course, many, many regulatory documents and policies. Uh, and how do we get those square with the comprehensive plan, with the zoning ordinance, and to make sure that we're, we're really providing the best retail environment we possibly can for our community. Uh, so what is urban retail? Uh, urban retail can be defined by what it is not. Uh, it's not strip centers. It's not community shopping centers. It's not malls. It's clusters of stores accessible by surrounding residential areas within walking distance. And it offers neighborhood goods and services, uh, but draws from a wider market area. Um, in, in our particular community, uh, urban retail is generally those, those spaces found in the ground floor of office buildings uh, or residential buildings or hotels or any buildings. We have had a long policy within our urban districts to create exciting, interesting ground floor space, which has led to a policy uh, that that generally is described as retail everywhere, uh, and that's one of the issues we're trying to address. So in the Arlington context, the, the building in the upper upper left corner is a, a brand new restaurant in a residential building that actually delivered about a month ago. Uh, the restaurant opened, I think, on the day the building opened. Uh, but this is a case of brand new construction with a, a new ground floor restaurant. The building to the right of that is about a block away in a, a retail strip that dates from the 1930s. Uh, but, the, but the use, Spider Kelly's, um, is relatively new. It's a little over a year old, and it's a, a dining and entertainment venue. Uh, to the lower left, the Bayou Bakery is a brand new business in an office building uh, about a, a block away from the, the courthouse. Uh, and then right a block away from that is a new restaurant, uh, Fireworks, uh, that is located within a hotel. And so you can see, regardless of what the, the, the primary use, we tried to put uh, retail spaces uh, in the ground floor. We have these little remnants of, of retail space from Arlington before uh, we really redeveloped Arlington. And Jill will show you some of the redevelopment uh, type pictures. But this is an older retail strip, and the Burger Shack is something that just opened a, a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's kind of a reuse in an older the, uh, older retail strip. Whereas a few blocks from that, Sweet Green uh, is a brand new organic uh, salad bar or restaurant um, that uh, that opened in the ground floor of a residential building uh, in the Boston neighborhood. And then in another neighborhood, uh, Crystal City, uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, kind of the antithesis of Sweet Green. Um, opened recently in an expansion, a bump out of an old office building. Uh, and the building there on the bottom right is an Irish pub uh, created right right down to the detail from, from materials and furnishings brought over from Ireland. But it's actually in the ground floor of a, of a one-year-old office building. Um, then we have in the upper left in, in the Sherlington neighborhood right near um, the pub I just mentioned, uh, uh, a small, like two-story residential building over some uh, some retail that actually is a liner space to the parking garage for the office building I just showed you, and so we've got a, a hair cuttery in there. But Cake Love is a kind of a local uh, bakery uh, uh, iconic kind of uh, location, and then down the street in Sherlington, in an older uh, kind of retail area, uh, you have Yogi Berry. Uh, a new, uh, what do you call them, uh, frozen yogurt kind of. You could tell that I'm more of a Buffalo Wild Wings kind of guy. Um, but this is uh, a, a new a new concept that's in in Sherlington. Then we have other uh, retail. The one on the lower left is an Orvis store. It's part of a larger um, commercial complex, but the parking for the retail is actually over the stores that line uh, line the two streets, Clarendon Boulevard and I think it's Highland Street. 
And then uh, what we have in the lower right is uh, the, the, it's almost like one of those facadectomies where we saved an old hardware store and then built a building behind it. And then the hardware store, of course, closed and was converted to an Irish pub. Um, I think we have more Irish pubs than Ireland does at this point. But uh, you can see that what we've tried to do is to, to activate the ground floor of the spaces by putting retail, dining and entertainment, and actual shopping type retail in uh, wherever we possibly can with the idea that uh, everywhere that you would walk, you have an interesting kind of retail environment to walk by. Developers and brokers have challenged the current policies as being too rigid, too bureaucratic, and misguided. Uh, other than that, they're perfect. Um, the retail everywhere uh, kind of concept, again, how do you activate the street? Well, you have some lively uh, retail uses along the street. Uh, it, it doesn't work everywhere. We have too many spots where, where it's uh, not contiguous and continuous along a street front. Um, the market is not there yet. Um, there are secondary retail streets. And so we started looking at what, are, what have we done wrong? We've done a good job over the last 20 years. And as we've developed from uh, you know, very suburban to a much more urban kind of place, uh, at, at creating vibrant urban retail um, spaces. Uh, and, uh, but we, we made some mistakes along the way. Uh, we chartered a retail task force. Uh, to, to look at what makes retail successful, what makes urban retail successful. Um, and, and they've done their work, uh, which I'll report on in a minute. And then the county board has requested, as a result of the, the multiple studies we've done, to revise our retail policies, recommend policy and regulatory changes. And those are the kinds of things that, that Jill is going to be talking about. So it's, it's not often that, that a uh, an economic development agency is asked to do a report, or a volunteers in our case, to do a report on all the mistakes that we've made over the last 20 years. In other words, what have we done uh, that provides room for improvement? And uh, we just love this picture because it just shows how dejected this poor young lady is walking by a vacant retail space. You know, could have seen something exciting and interesting, could have gone in and had a beer, but just nothing. I mean, just walk on, no place to go. Um, and, and so one of the things that we looked at are marginal retail locations where we've got interior spaces that have no street frontage. They really lack external signage. Now, there's no separate entrance or access apart from the main entrance or the, or the lobby entrance. And there's no window displays to speak of. The building on the top, in the top photo was one of the first office buildings that was, the, was built in the regenerated Boston neighborhood. But it's got suburban features to it. It's got this kind of drive through in the front. Um, you get all the, in, into the retail through what is clearly an office lobby. It doesn't read retail in any way. And so this stuff never really worked. The retailers never have made it in, in that location. And then we've got places that just kind of make no sense, where we've got retail on the, the, the backs of buildings. The top picture is interesting because it shows an alleyway. We actually required retail space on an alley, um, which made no sense at all. Um, uh, it's, it's fortunate that the, the retailers there have made it because they have done such a good job of marketing that they've been able to capture kind of the, the local market. It's a, there's a dry cleaners in there and some local servicing uh, businesses. Um, there's no wayfinding uh, or visibility from the main roadway. The bottom picture shows um, no, no, no way finding to show there's retail along the street, just a sign that says dead end. And that was actually a through street, but because the neighborhood uh, uh, adjacent to it did not want to see it, they described it cut through traffic through their neighborhood, they, they basically created a cul-de-sac of this street, which killed all the retail along uh, the street. Um, and there's no real signs, only small blade signs on the spaces in this whole thing never actually worked or functioned at all. Then we've got just plain secondary locations, uh, areas that are in between viable retail markets. Uh, they lack the necessary foot traffic, customer demand. Spaces don't front on the primary retail space. They're difficult to lease. I think the top picture kind of shows just how, how far from the uh, retail area and, and how non-retail an area uh, we have retail requirements for 
uh, for the ground floor spaces. Uh, and then just how the spaces kind of are dead if there's really nothing else going around. And so sometimes the Main Street uh, is a great retail location and a block away uh, it's not. Then we have, uh, you know, again, these secondary markets between retail clusters where we may have some very viable retail areas. A good example is Clarendon. But then as you go into Virginia Square, you've got uh, spaces that just clearly aren't retail space. There might be uses along along the main streets, but they're not producing demand for the retail necessarily. They lack the foot traffic. Um, they don't front on a primary street. They're difficult to lease. You can see the four lease signs there. You can see just kind of how dull the space is, too. And that gets into the signage issues. Um, we require generally comprehensive sign plans for, uh, for larger scale development projects uh, or major buildings. Um, but it starts to get into kind of over-designed. Um, you know, you've got the primary use is an office building or a residential building. Not, not a, it's not designed as retail space. And so in trying to be very neat, um, they become very, very boring. Um, and the, even though you've got some nice awnings and a beautiful building, it doesn't read retail. There's nothing that's drawing you into this space. It's just there. Uh, it's safe. It's clean. It's functional, but it's not very exciting. We get into the classic issue of retailers versus planners, um, signage and street trees. You know, planners want to want to do lots of street trees. We seem to think that we learned in planning school to, to put street trees along all the retail streets, although they obstruct all the retail signs, hacking off all of the retailers. Um, and they really do present like visual obstacles. You can see in the bottom, even though it's a very, very viable small. Uh, retail area in a neighborhood, um, the trees just about kill the retail space uh, in terms of visibility. And then where signage, again, is just very limited under our sign ordinance. Uh, the amount of uh, grand opening or for lease signage is limited. It's difficult for building owners to market the available space, difficult for new tenants to, to promote their new businesses. And if you look very carefully on the top, right in the middle, very kind of low on the window, you see what we allow as a for lease sign. Um, you just driving by, you'd never know it's for lease. You actually have to walk up to it to read it. Uh, and the bottom picture, it shows it again there as well, another for lease sign. Uh, storefronts and transparency have become huge issues in our community. Um, uh, in, in the uh, in the top left, you could see, uh, you can't even tell what the building really is. Um, uh, there's no real visibility of it. I think it's a CVS pharmacy. Uh, but they've got the windows blocked. You can't see what's going on. There's a brand new CVS on the right. And although we require a huge amount of window areas in the ground floor of the spaces, um, the retailer has blocked all of the spaces so you can't see into the store. Uh, so the idea that you could see what's inside, you could see what's going on, you can see if there's people about. Is, is all kind of fought by the idea the retailer wants to maximize their shelf space and put all their shelving up against the windows. Um, banks are really street face killers, or can be. You know, this PNC bank on the lower left um, has managed to kill three street faces. Not only does it kill the major retail street, uh, which the space on the left is, but it, it, it actually goes around the corner, so it kills the, the streets on either side. Um, and so, you know, old saying, nobody ever window shops the bank, but you can't even see what's going on in the bank. You can't even see if the bank is open, if there's anybody inside. And so it just deadens that whole portion of the street. And you know, an another uh, picture of a bank that's a little bit more well done, but it doesn't, you know, they put the blinds down so you can't tell what's going, what's going on inside. Um, dark windows, uh, they obscure, again, the visibility, the transparency. Uh, businesses often cover their windows with paper. Um, the uniform awnings really kind of create a lackluster streetscape. Uh, and so there's design elements related to materials and, uh, and, and uh, the facades of the buildings that fight against successful retail. The pu public realm, you know, we've got many areas where we do have a really successful public realm where we've got sidewalk cafes and things like that. But we also have you know, overly wide sidewalks. This happens to be a street that 
uh, where the metro was a cut and cover operation, so the sidewalks are fairly large because the metro tunnel is under them. Um, but the space in front of the businesses are permitted for outdoor dining, but for nothing else. And so if you don't have a restaurant there, you really have it's a large sidewalk area that's not particularly inviting. Uh, nobody's going to cluster there. Nobody's going to stand there or sit there. And they just become stagnant places. And then the parking issues become really big issues for us as well. There's a mismatch between the business and the meter hours. Uh, resulting in non-retail users parking uh, in long-term retail spaces. This is an area in Boston. Um, potentially, it could be successful retail district. You could see the shop uh, is open till 9 p.m., uh, but the meters only go till 6. And because it's a fairly uh, densely developed uh, residential area, um, residents will seek out these meters at 6 o'clock and then tie them up the rest of the night. So there's three hours of primary time for the retailer to be successful and absolutely zero street parking because the meter hours uh, are set at the wrong times. Obviously things we could do something about, which is what we're, we're trying to do it a little more comprehensively. We did a study through a task force called Boutiques, Bistros, and Banks. We brought in experts. We brought uh, people in from the National Retail Federation. We brought a, uh, an urban designer in from Virginia Tech. We brought in some retail brokers. We brought in retail architects. Um, we really wanted, to, and of course, a lot of retailers to find out what makes retail successful. Um, and we came up with four elements. Retail must be convenient. It must be appealing. It must be activating. And it must be sustainable. In terms of convenience, successful retail cannot be located just anywhere. It requires some concentration and massing. It must be accessible by multiple modes of transportation with convenient parking. And market demand drives retail location, not the preferences of planners. So when we have this retail everywhere policy, we ultimately end up with places that are just not going to be successful. They're not interesting enough for people to cluster there. Um, and we end up with secondary uses and just rarely, rather dead kinds of spaces. Retail spaces need to be appealing. People like spaces that are interesting, lively, clean, safe, and attractive. They are drawn by a desirable mix of uses. Retail can be messy, a mishmash of color, texture, varying facade, signage, window display. No single right mix of uses. The market changes over time. The challenges that we've had as planners have been uh, the, the retail mix, obviously. We want to have local retailers, not all chains and franchises. So how do you do that? Uh, and especially how do you do it through regulatory um, uh, processes? Uh, we want to make sure we don't have uh, bars and restaurants crowding out uh, retailers where there's a they're actually selling something you can go in and buy. These spaces need to be active and vibrant uh, before 5 o'clock in the afternoon. So you want to be able to have uh, stores uh, as well as the nightlife types of, uh, of entertainment venues. Retail needs to be activating. It thrives on vibrant streets. Uh, encourage people to uh, shop, dine, run errands, linger, mingle. Exciting destinations include not only traditional retail, but businesses that cater to entertainment, education, cultural, civic needs throughout the daytime, the evening, and the weekend periods. And then we want retail to be sustainable. Those using retail areas may differ by the time of day and by the reasons they are in the space. For instance, the, the residents are in the space in the evening. The employers, employees are, are in the spaces during the, uh, during the daytime hours and the visitors that come in from uh, elsewhere around the area to, uh, to take advantage of, uh, of the retail opportunities uh, generally are there in the evening. Demographic and psychographic characteristics uh, shape buying power and they ma uh, buying patterns and whoops and they, they matter a lot. So we have done a fair amount of psychographic studies in terms of, of who lives in the area and then kind of who visits the area to um, to give us a sense of, of how the area is functioning and who's in the space. So thank you, Terry. I think you were able to go over a lot of sort of where we are today, what are problems that we've seen, uh, and some ideas to move us forward into the future. But as you mentioned in the opening remarks, you know, 
as planners, we love our policies and regulations. So we're looking at Arlington specifically, and we have numerous policies here in Arlington that have an influence over retail. It ranges from our Retail Action Plan, which was adopted by the board in 2001. We have streetscape standards that sort of dictate width of sidewalks, placement of trees, even types of trees. We have our zoning ordinance, and we even have uh, sector plans that guide. And we have to start framing of how do we look at this? And sort of how do these policies apply? How do the regulations apply? And really started thinking about it of, of these policies actually influence retail from both the, the inside, the outside, and all around. So the inside, we, we, there are regulations. Um, believe it or not, we, ha we have definitions listed in our zoning ordinance, but one of the key definitions is missing. We do not have a definition for retail. I think it was realized that we just we don't have that. But we want to make certain that we have clarity in a definition and a definition that provides flexibility. The inside of buildings, with the special exception site plan that we have, oftentimes our, the first floor has been required to be retail, but it's being planned without a tenant in mind, and it becomes challenging. So even before a tenant is known, sort of the, the openings are set, uh, the floor to ceiling heights are set, the loading and service areas are already set. We've become a, much better uh, over time. We've become, I think, more knowledgeable about retail and looking and making certain that we have all of these elements. I think it's one of those things we've, we've realized we need to, to help even more so. Again, sort of the uses, it, you have to define what can be inside of a place. And, and generally looking at four different types of how these uses are. It's a permanent use, a sub substitute use, a temporary use, or an interim use. So the permanent use is, is what can go in there forever, basically. It's the retail, a place that you can actually go and buy something and take with you. Uh, restaurants and food establishments, I think, Terry, you were mentioning, you know, we have a little bit of attention now. We're, we're seeing a lot of the restaurants and food establishments now. We need places that we can buy something. Uh, services, and, and we do need these. We do need the banks. We, we also want places where people can go and get their hair cut uh, and their dry cleaning. And then also cultural, and the cultural for you know, theater, some galleries. These are they're all things that, that help with the street space. So the alternative uses, well, there are areas in the county that don't require the full retail and, and that actually characteristic help to enliven the street. So child care centers, uh, conference centers, schools and education centers, all people coming in and out throughout the day um, and, and provide that, that the interest. So we also have some temporary uses, and, and we want to make certain that we just don't have vacant storefronts. And we, in our research, we discovered there's a lot of other things that can be done. There's pop-up stores that happen more seasonal, art or other exhibits. It could be sales offices while the building is getting going or leasing offices, and sometimes events. Um, one of our, our bids here in Arlington County has been pretty successful in and using vacant space and including vacant retail space um, as it's been coming online to host some events that have been very successful. And it gets people energized about the area, and it also helps to just market that space. And then the question is the interim uses. It, sometimes something's been developed and it's, it's put on hold for a little bit, and or that it's happens, but there's not much of a retail there there yet. So we've been working with some developers and trying to come up with more of a flexible space. Uh, it's a space that could work as retail or retail in the future, but is residential today and can fit a variety of, of uses there. And then we focus on the outside. Again, looking at the regulations first. Uh, looking at the exterior of the building and that, again, our zoning ordinance, our site plans that we go through, uh, very, uh, the, the site plans are very prescriptive at the end with all of the conditions and how the, the building must look, you know, the building code and other ordinances. 
And we need to make it a little bit easier for retailers and other users that are coming into the first floor space to be able to change that facade. And, you know, so it's part of the design. Um, it includes the materials, and that helps with the whole the, the product of the what's inside too. Um, you know, you can't judge a book by its cover, but retail is very different. You need that cover. You want it to look like retail. So it does include the materials, the character, the transparency, as Terry has mentioned, the fenestration, and the opening. It includes signs. Signs are very important. And in fact, it was recognized by our county board. We were doing an update to our zoning ordinance. And originally, we were going to start with more of a, a broader update. And I think it was realized that we need to look at our sign ordinance. We need to be able to define what is a sign. Right now, our ordinance is, is pretty wide. And it includes even light is a sign. Um, but light can actually help the retail. And it, it can provide a neat placemaking element, too sort of what the signs are, the types, the number, the sizes. Also, the, the streetscape itself, our rules and regulations currently you know, state what you can and cannot do on the, your streetscape. So the retail, it, it does come out. We, you know, with the sidewalk, with, we want to encourage activity out onto the sometimes very wide sidewalk. We have the outdoor seating, and the questions come up, for example, with sandwich board or merchandise on the street, um, being able to have street furniture and having people enjoy that space. And then a new term that, that Terry just introduced me to today is, is this outside in the, the street tail. Um, there are other types of retail uses that really start adding to the vibrancy of a space. Um, it can include our food carts and trucks, and we've actually seen quite a few of them recently and here in Arlington and food and markets. Uh, I think we've been very successful with our farmers markets here in Arlington. So we've looked at the inside, we've looked at the outside, and, and now it's really starting to look at the, the all around. And one, retail to be successful, the location so important. And that context is important as well. Um, in Arlington, we have metro urban villages. We also have other urban villages. And I'll get into these in a little bit. And then some neighborhood nodes. But as we were looking through with sort of the, the all around, is really how, how do we get the right uses in the right places? And we had this retail action plan, and it was it looked at a street hierarchy, and it was fairly linear in its approach, and it started you know it started almost putting retail everywhere. But then we started figure you know trying to figure out well, where does it go, where does it want to go, where should it go, and we did struggle with it, and I think we still continue to struggle with it. So. So when talking about the metro corridors, with Arlington, we have the Roslyn, uh, the Clarendon Courthouse area, Virginia Square, and Boston. And then in the Jefferson Davis corridor, Pentagon City and Crystal City. And with these, we've really created some neat urban villages. And they've really changed over time. Um, some locations actually had a good amount of retail to begin with. It changed over time. So the, the retail didn't necessarily move out. It, it, in Clarendon, in particular, it might have become a little bit more funky. Um, and then redevelopment occurred. And we've seen a change in that. And I, you know, that's been a question also is you know, how do you keep a balance of sort of the more homegrown retail, the chain retail, um, and the mom and pop? I think you know the, the next couple of slides that we'll go through is really looking at sort of how we've changed. Um, but what are the key elements that are important for each of these metro corridors? So with our metro urban village, you know we did have some criteria, and and in each of these, really making certain that we had a grocery store, um, and that 
a resident that's living in these urban villages um, can find sort of the regular neighborhood retail and service uses, um, but recognizing others might come into the trade area from outside. But each of our urban villages is developed with a different character uh, over time. So it's sort of been interesting as, as it's moved along. And we start looking at some old slides, and this is, is Roslyn. And there's a, a Roslyn circle as it comes in. Um, streetcar had gone into the circle, and, and well, it, it, was a, it was a different time and a different place, and lower scale building, um, banks there, hotels there. But, but there, there was a retail element to it. And then Roslyn today has, has really changed. Um, this is a fairly super current picture, but it's, the skyline is changing. Roslyn has grown. And I think we've actually learned some lessons from Roslyn as, as it grew. Sort of it's, it's almost entering now into its third phase of reinvention. And, and what's happened is with its second phase, with a lot of the office towers, we, there was an element, we had a lot of skywalks that were put in. And I think we've realized that we really want people on the sidewalks and using that the storefront and, and bringing people down to the street level. And Roslyn's still getting over that. And it's slowly as, as now the sort of the third set of redevelopment has occurred, the, the skywalks are being removed and we're putting people down on the street. Uh, and I think there's been a, a more of a push to have more retail there. So the one thing that's interesting with Roslyn is slowly we're also seeing more residents move into Roslyn over the time. Uh, a lot for a long time it was more of an office place. And, and that does hurt our retail. Um, the retailers would close uh, after five when office workers would leave. So I, I think now we're seeing more people coming into the area, uh, and the retail is slowly changing. And we have Clarendon. Uh, I think you know, Terry had some, some photos earlier. Uh, you know, Clarendon right after the war, uh, sort of a small scale, you know, the, Clar you know, the Clarendon Circle. But there was retail up and down. It was Arlington's historic. It was the downtown. It was the shopping area for Arlington. Um, and when things have changed, you can see it's really grown up. Um, but we've been able to keep a lot of the, and those are actually where some of the mom and pops are, are still located. Um, but we have seen quite a lot of development. Again, in re the Clarendon area has almost been rebranded as our sort of our live entertainment area. We have a lot of live entertainment in this area, and a lot of restaurants. Um, we do have Market Common uh, that is in there, where there's more true retail, where you can actually buy something. But there are a lot of restaurants in in the Clarendon area. You know, I think this slide sort of tells it all that that upper upper left-hand slide, it's, it's an old education center and, 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 and parking areas. Um, and for that middle slide is, is what, how that education center was redeveloped and additional retail wrapped around it. And the bottom left slide, that's market common. So this whole area has really been uh, re-envisioned and there's a lot, there's retail there, but there's also more people there. Uh, I think the slide on the upper left, it's pretty much what most of uh, the Roslyn Boston corridor looked like in 1990. And so as we've created these new urban villages pretty much from scratch, uh, this is what we started from. So uh, we inserted you know, a major retail component into the entire area as we developed it, um, but we didn't start with much. No. And I think this next slide, it just shows what is happening in Clarendon now. And it's, it's a lot. You know, there are people, people are enjoying, we have the restaurants, we have retail, um, people are out and enjoying, and, and we've seen redevelopment. But we've also seen development that's actually been, been pretty contextual, too, uh, and, and looking at what, what was existing and, and playing off of that. Um, I, I think, again, this, this harkens back to sort of some of the slides that we're seeing. It almost looks a little desolate. This is actually an old department store here. Uh, and you know, further down as you're going along, and 
in Virginia Square. And you know, things have changed over time. Um, there's been a lot of development there. We have the, the FDIC, which is sort of located central. Uh, they have a campus there. And, and behind that was the grocery store. So for, for Virginia Square, a giant was built with that complex. Um, but adjacent to the FDIC, I, I sort of going right to the building, the old department store now um, is George Mason University. And the, the parking lot that's adjacent to, to that is sort of somewhat central. It is now developed as a nice plaza and, and another piece of the George Mason University. And with all of this, you know, we've seen some retail develop. There hasn't been as much along that sort of central spine that you see running diagonally through the, the, the photo there. But slowly, as we're getting some more people, and, uh, and uh, both in residence and also office, Virginia Square for a long time was just more, a lot more residential. I think as we're seeing more and more people there, we're starting to see more retail. And then we have Boston. You know, as we, we move up in our urban villages, um, some of the buildings are still existing, sort of in the in the background of the, the picture near the, the top. There's a, a blue roof, and that's an IHOP that's still there, um, but it's it's been serving the area, and it still does serve the area quite well. But but Boston itself has really grown up, um, and with Boston, we do have the Boston Common Mall. Um, at, and even as retail, that has, has seen a struggle, too, um, and trying to figure out you know, how to bring the, the, the retail to the outside. And, and along one of the streets, you know, the, the mall did work with some of its retailers to try to actually bring some of the spines out to the front and, and break open the facades to get people into the mall just from the outside rather than just through the main doors of the mall. And then throughout, you know, we're seeing little bits and pieces of retail. And I think Terry, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's, you know, you were doing some some numbers this morning and recognizing the amount of retail that we add, typically on our first floors every year, is akin to a small shopping center, a neighborhood shopping center. Yeah, urban retail tends to be kind of lost in the shuffle because it. You know, it's a secondary use to the primary use, which is either an office building, a residential building, or a hotel. And so, although we count in, you know, it's 9,000 square feet here, 12,000 square feet there, and yet we have been adding 350,000 square feet a year of urban retail, which is equivalent to a community-sized shopping center. And and nowhere does it is it ever recorded kind of as retail. It's, it is not recognized that we are adding a shopping center a year, and yet that much additional supply comes onto the market. So it is a challenge to keep it filled. Um, obviously, the demand has increased radically, uh, but I think even although the development that we've had, just in the Roslyn Boston quarter, 20 million square feet of office space, 22,000 housing units in the last 20 years, is not sufficient demand to create uh, or to support all of the retail that we have tried to uh, have uh, developed within the quarter. And Terry, also you know, with that number that we're seeing, sort of almost this, this lost retail, it's managed individually. There's sort of no cohesiveness about it. So trying to to create synergies can sometimes be very challenging. Um, and I think that's what we've realized. And it's it's one of those lessons. And it, it goes back to sort of that all around question: How do we address it? So Sort of looking at at least our corridors, it really does get into well, how, with sort of the diverse number of retail spaces, you know, how how do you make that work? Um, and I think that's where it gets to well, maybe you don't need retail everywhere, and you know, start thinking about those other uses, those alternative uses that make sense that help to activate the street. So in Arlington, not only do we have sort of these the urban village areas along our metro corridors. We also have some non-metro urban villages. Um, these are neighborhoods. They don't have the, the metro, the heavy rail, but they're transit-oriented. Um, and and again, along these in these areas, the, the same elements 
of for our metro villages, you know, having the grocery store, making sense that there, there's ample retail and service for for the residents that live there. And they all have their different characters too. So this is Sherlington. Um, Sherlington is off of 395 in Arlington. Um, it, there was a smaller uh, one, two story, uh, about a one to two block existing retail uh, that was there. And it was redeveloped. It was part of a, a phased development site plan um, of about 25 acres in total. And what was done, we have sort of Sherlington today, that the middle top picture uh, is sort of the older part. And you can see along in Sherlington all sorts of awnings. Uh, it starts to address the one of those the room for improvement, the you know the standard awning all across. Where you start seeing that the, the personalities of the storefronts coming out in their awnings in their storefronts. Um, and again, we we do have a transit station, that's, or a bus station that's there now. But one of the key elements was was a Harris Teeter. Now, interestingly, when when Sherlington was developed, again. One of the key points was actually a liner retail around existing theater, uh, and a movie theater. A new theater, signature theater, was built um, with a library, so there's a civic presence there. But that, that grocery store was important. But because this was a, a, a phase development plan, there were several conditions, and the grocer really had to, to work at it. So. What was interesting is I think you saw some of the photos that, that Terry showed about the transparency. And, and oftentimes we have grocers that you know, they, they put their shelving units against their windows uh, and really block it out. There were very specific conditions in Sherlington. So for the, the Harris Teeter that went in, they had bought special shelving. And, and you can actually see through the windows and, and see their products. And it, it's actually a pretty novel idea, and um, you actually can see what you want. You might want to buy. It's a great store, uh, although we certainly had our challenges with it because, in order to uh, allow Sherlington to effectively double in size, we did a, a pretty much a joint venture with a developer, a Federal Realty Investment Trust, and live transit station and some of the infrastructure and uh, the, the parking garage. But we had a requirement. Uh, again, our thought is you can't have a viable uh, urban village without a grocery store. And so we required them to build a grocery store. But it's a small grocery store. It's only about 20,000 square feet. And none of the grocery stores, the chains, really wanted to do a 20,000 square foot store. And so they had the developer knew they had to sign a grocery in order to be able to, um, to do their project. They had signed Harris Teeter. Uh, and then Harris Peter got cold feet. They were in, they were out. They were in, they were out. And they had uh, a number of things that they had to get their minds around. One was the transparency issue. Another was having grocery shoppers park in a garage instead of, yeah. uh, instead of a, a surface lot. Uh, the aisles are narrower, so the carts are smaller. Um, and, and so that was a little bit of a change from their normal way of doing business. Uh, and because they had less shelf space, um, they actually had to stock the shelves more frequently. They, they didn't necessarily reduce the range of products they were selling, but they had less shelf space per product, and they had to replace them more, more quickly uh, or more frequently. So they had to do business a little bit differently to be in the ground floor uh, of this residential building. Uh, we had actually overheard some of their executives kind of complaining about it one day shortly after it opened. And uh, one of the residents took them to task, saying it's a great store, they love the store, uh, and you ought to pay some more attention to it. And in fact, it's one of their most successful stores in terms of, of sales per square foot. They have now gone on to do uh, at least three other stores as urban models within the community. Um, and, and, and so they, they have proven beyond a doubt that you can do these kind of urban groceries uh, very effectively with really high, high levels of sales. So, and I think it also starts to get to that, that inside question, too, on all of those 
at the grocery store, which is a little bit different, there are different needs for a grocer. Um, those the floor to ceiling heights are very important. Um, and that's, that's true for all retail space, is making certain that you have, have that, that ample space. But with a Harris Cedar, for example, in here, I think they have a, a mezzanine that's a little bit larger than a lot of their other prototype mezzanines. And it includes a, a lot more uh, of product that's up there on the mezzanine. So they have to rethink that. But I, again, it gets to that, that inside question of, of when you're looking at retail and designing it, it's, it's helpful to be thinking about the inside, too, um, and making certain that you can service it uh, with grocery stores, especially, you know, the, the loading that they receive and their requirements uh, and also sort of their trash requirements are, are pretty extensive. So that needs to be planned up front. So as, as you're working in looking at retail um, and the variety of different types of retail, you really need to be cognizant of, of not only how it looks on the outside, but making certain that the retail functions on the inside. And Jill's point is really good. I mean, it's, we've become pretty adept at working with urban groceries now. Um, and, and actually, we have a, a study online uh, about urban groceries and the trends on grocery stores. But we have had to seek out people in the, in the companies uh, from the major grocers uh, and make pitch for urban models and for the, a little bit more flexibility. But it's really hard to retrofit a grocery store into, into a building. And we just did one in Clarendon where we were successful at attracting a Trader Joe's. Uh, but every bit of uh, issue, every planning issue you can imagine, from the fenestration, from the stairwells, and and fire exits to uh, on-street uh, display of merchandise to uh, reservation of parking spaces within a within the garage. All of that stuff had to be negotiated uh, uh, in order to make it work for the uh, for the grocer and to make it meet the planning uh, parameters that we have in our neighborhoods because because it has to fit. It has to fit right. Well, I think you know looking at another. Uh, Urban Village is, is along Columbia Pike and sort of an older area uh, along Columbia Pike and sort of the, the larger picture and there's the CVS and sort of in, in the back uh, it was an old grocery store, a giant, and, and that is actually under development at this point in time. But right along this strip uh, on, on Columbia Pike, the, you know, one again, is one of our key elements was to have grocery stores. Well. One was you know, was taken down, and it was a Safeway that was removed and, and redeveloped, um, and actually redeveloped quite nicely. It's, it's the, the the lower picture, um, but when the next site adjacent to it came to re be redeveloped, you know, there was a giant, and I think everybody pushed it. The giant needed to be be kept there. Yeah, we couldn't uh, lose we couldn't lose the main grocery store in this in this district, and it was particularly problematic because we thought we had done this marvelous thing by creating. Uh, a redevelopment area that was a form-based code. Uh, and it was a very urban uh, form-based code that was basically uh, designed to provide redevelopment incentives. However, when we designed the form-based code, we didn't make provisions for a grocery store. And so we literally had to, to kind of rethink the form-based code to some extent uh, and make some uh, adjustments and some compromises in order to be able to keep a full-service grocery store in this community. Now, the grocers are, are correct. They've got certain parameters that relative to what they need to be successful. And the giant was clearly not one that's had an urban model. They, they typically do the, uh, you know, the, the enormous parking lot and a and hundred, no, not a hundred. They didn't lay up about 60,000 square foot stores. Um, and they still wanted the same store size. So, so they had to make some adjustments to to, to their model, and we had to make some adjustments to the form-based code to be able to make this work. Well, and actually, I mean, we determined that that ultimately the project that included the giant, we, we didn't even use it as a, as a form-based code. It required a lot of changes. Um, so we did another type of special exception. We were, a, we were able to achieve it, uh, but it, it was challenging because, again, I'll, I'll, I'll harken back to the inside, outside, all around. One, it just wasn't sitting on the inside. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't make it work. But two, I think as, as we're working, especially with grocery stores, um, but, but other users too, the outside, the signs, uh, how it works. Uh, the grocery stores, not only is it a grocer, but oftentimes now are a full service, 
it, it's your pharmacy. It, my husband's bank in there. Uh, you can buy your flowers and, and pretty much everything else there, and, and, and your bakery too. And, and they, they want to get that out so you know what, what's inside. Uh, and with these large format grocers, it does become a little bit more challenging um, with, with respect to their displays and their windows. So I think, you know, in looking at the redevelopment, um, we've gone from sort of lots of parking, parking lots in the front to, to bringing the buildings up to the sidewalk, you know, the back of the sidewalk, and, and making it more of a, a lively place, bringing retail right up front, which is akin to some of the, the, the form that we were seeing in, in older parts. Sort of that second phase pushed everything back with the large parking lots in front, and now we're trying to support forward. Columbia Pike is a little bit unique, too, in that the county is working along there, and, and we have the ability to designate certain areas as a, a special district and allow for some funding um, to develop additional parking, public parking. So that, that gets to that question about amounts of parking for the, the grocery store and the other retail in the area. So we're trying to recreate 1920s America which was a pre-automobile society and uh, adjust to the uh, to the needs of the current time. So we're, we're going to have a streetcar going down Columbia Pike as well. So it, this will end up being 1920s America all over again. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a model everybody should follow, but it seems to be working for us. But in Arlington, so we, we have our urban villages, um, both located on our metro lines and, and off but still with transit orient. But we also have some neighborhood nodes. Um, it, it's an older, um, more of a suburban type neighborhood retail. Um, and just a couple of images. We have, you know, the West Elfar Market, which is up upper left. Um, it it sort of evolved over time. Some of what of a more of a market. It's now sort of become known as a, a higher end beer store um, and and a, a beer garden now, which is has been under discussion. Uh, and, and that's actually you know, getting to the question of the outside, you know, wanting to be outside. The inside, are they a restaurant? Are they a grocery store? Um, so it's really looked at all of our policies and regulations of, of how do you create something there that it doesn't fit into any box that we have currently. But also it needs to be sensitive to the neighborhood um, because this fits right in the middle of pretty much a you know, single family residential. There are some apartments uh, nearby, but they are garden style apartments. So, so how do you play that against each other? Right across the street from the Westover Market, there's another small strip, sort of these work right across the street from each other. Um, and again, some, some tension there too is you know the question of, well, how can they be outside? Why can't I? So it's really looking at our regulations, and especially as it fits into our, our smaller retail nodes uh, within the neighborhood. And then uh, the bottom two pictures are Buckingham Center. This is a historic area. Um, the crossroads, this is two pretty major roads, Pershing and Glebe Road here in, in Arlington. There's a post office. Um, as a, a key feature in here. And then the retail has developed over time. Uh, and I think it's fairly stable. It, it does have the parking up front. Um, and although they, they have sort of the, the standard, they, the, the retail doesn't really speak as individuals. I think they've kept with the architecture of the time. And they have the neon lights. They have the green awnings. And they really haven't changed that over time. Uh, there was some push on the other, and, and there's retail across the street from this as well. And you know there w had been plans for redevelopment of this whole area, and they've since been, you know, they're not going forward at this point in time. But I think everybody realizes that this is a special node, and, and this is an area that's really surrounded by garden apartments. And in, and in fact, we do have some affordable housing in this area, and and we need to recognize that although it's not right on our metro, it's fairly close, and it's along bus lines, at least, again, it, it's still harking to the, the points of making sure, certain that our residents have the ability to get services and goods and, their, and groceries uh, in a convenient manner. So 
making certain we also have some of these smaller nodes throughout our neighborhoods is, is very important. Um, at, but I think more importantly is, is the, you know, it gets to that outside. We're talking a little bit about the all around, but the outside, contextually, how does it fit into the neighborhood? So signs are going to have to be a little bit different. Um, the height, the sort of how the building is designed, needs to be a little bit different. It needs to accommodate the retail, but it does need to be thoughtful and designed to fit into the neighborhood. I'm going to just leave it on that slide for a minute, and let's kind of talk about where we've, where we've been, Br sure. bring it together a little bit. Um, Arlington has, has been very successful. Uh, and we're known to be very successful, and and kind of some of the markets that we've created, like like Clarendon and Boston, and and uh, the renewed uh, Crystal City, are all pretty effective kinds of places, and and often models for how to do transit-oriented development, smart growth. On the other hand, you can see there's been some dissatisfaction with with how it's happened, and not every uh, you know not every pitch has been a strike. I mean, some sometimes it's a little low and outside, and uh, I think what we've been told is now now is a good time uh, to, to keep score, to, to, to figure out what we've done really well, uh, to try to look at it from a policy perspective. I think Jill did a great job of framing the policy with, with the idea of inside, outside, and all around. Uh, but we are literally now looking, as planners do, at all our policy documents. How does this, how does this kind of move through to modifying the, the sign ordinance? What do we need to do to the zoning ordinance to be able to uh, uh, to make it uh, reflect what the needs of successful retail are. How do we change our development processes so that we think of the right things at the right time? Uh, it used to be we never thought of how you service the ground floor retail when we approved an office building while, or residential building, even more difficult. Well, now we do. We have to think up front exactly how we're going to do that. How does a higher floor plate on the first or higher floor, floor to ceiling height on the first floor affect the, the, the height limitations we have in our sector plans. Exactly. And, and it's, again, it gets back to the, the question of our, our zoning ordinance. And we have some zoning districts that measure by feet and some by story. So, you know, the, the projects that might be by story, that's fine. But those that have, a, you know, the absolute, well, it becomes challenging uh, by going from a 15-foot floor to ceiling height to maybe a 20 or, or in a case of a grocery store, maybe even 25, 30 feet that they need. And signs always seem to, to be simple to the people who have the solutions. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, for instance, uh, the, the idea of, of doing the sandwich board type sign. Simple opportunities, why don't we just copy their ordinance and allow it to happen here? Well, there's reasons why we don't allow sandwich boards right now. Um, you know, sometimes we've got wide sidewalks, but sometimes we have narrow sidewalks. What, what about um, the, the use of public space and, and them as tripping hazards or, or visual hazards if they're not the right size relative to, to being uh, uh, in an urban environment and, and blocking people's vision around corners and things like that? What about the fact that they might, they might become uh, flying objects in a windstorm? I mean, we hear all these kind of things. So for every, every solution that seems obvious, there are issues that need to be addressed. And they have to be addressed in, in conclusion or in, in cooperation with the community. The retailer might want it. Well, how does the surrounding community adopt it, accept it? So as planners, you know, building consensus, building uh, agreement around how we're going to do things and what we're going to do is what we are involved in now. But we wanted to, 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 to do the webinar on urban retail because we think there are so many elements uh, that have to all come together in the context of good planning. Uh, and we're struggling with all of them. We're going to look at every policy that we have and every plan that we have to see whether it makes sense and what kind of changes that we want to make that, that do make sense. And then, of course, we have to do it in the, in the typical what we call the Arlington way, where, where it's not a, it's not a, a, a top-down type of environment. It's a, it's a consensus building, everybody agrees to it first uh, type of political environment. So I do want to leave some time for questions. Um, and Cody was, I think, collecting some. So I'll, our, our last slide will just put up our contact information. So you have it there with our, our email addresses and also our website. The, the first website brings you to Arlington Economic Development's website. It's the ArlingtonVirginiaUSA.com. 
And the, the second one, the ArlingtonVA.us, brings you to the main Arlington County website. Um, and again, both, both of those websites have a wealth of information. Uh, the AED website does have a lot of papers. One Terry alluded to is about grocery stores. Yeah, um, that's the first of the two websites. We've got the grocery store study. We've got a study on, com on neighborhood commercial and how it's changed over time. We've got a study, uh, Jenny's study, on, uh, on uh, room for improvement. We've got the bistros, what makes good retail study. And I think we've got all the documents that Jill has collected as she's doing her policy analysis. So if those are of any help, help to you have at it. Cody? Yes, uh, we will go ahead and get started with questions. There have been a lot that have come in, so um, we'll go ahead and get started. So our first question is from Victoria. Um, do you have any suggestions for dealing with an area that is overbuilt for retail with a lot of vacant space? Um, she says that her community has established downtown and two newer new urbanism developments, but there isn't enough retail to go around. Well, it, you know, the thing is that retail is really constrained by demand, which is a function of income and households. And so you, you can't create more demand unless you create more income and households. Uh, so that, that can be a problem, the idea that the newer projects steal from older ones. When we've worked with other communities, we have uh, pretty much suggested that if you, you have to have a vision of what it is that you want to create, and then you have to figure out where you're going to steal the demand from. Uh, so it may be from a wider perspective. It may be uh, more visitor demand than resident demand. It may be um, looking at, at a neighboring community and trying to say, okay, well, you know, they've, they've got some supply here. We think we can do a better job from it. It's really hard to restructure these um, downtowns, especially in light of new competition. But I think you need to then try to figure out what your niche might conceivably be. Um, I'm also a faculty member at Virginia Tech in the planning school, so our planning students look at a lot of these, these communities around the area um, and, and try to find niches for them and try to match up the demand that you might find. But it, it's not real easy to do. Uh, and if you had totally lack demand, then, then you have even harder trouble. Stealing it from somebody else is easier than, than not having any at all. Well, I think also is, is what, what, what's the vision for the area. Um, you know, we were looking at are, are there, are there there are interim uses that could go in, are sort of the, the temporary uses to at least um, bring excitement about the area, pull people in to actually see the space, or are there the alternative uses that make sense and bring people there and, and maybe get into that niche um, that can use the space and, and bring activity and life to the area and actually bring people there. There have been some communities that have used educational institutions yeah. as a substitute use that seem to be successful. Okay, um, our next question, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Next so question. our next question is from Whitney. Um, she says that she works in a uh, smaller suburb and that their ordinance requires buildings to the front of the street. Um, often the street side is where the retailer wants to put the kitchen, the break room, storage, rather than the active environment that was designed in the planning process. Um, so the actual store and main entrance front ends up being on the parking lot side. Do you know how a planner can encourage the opposite, like different tactics that way? Uh, it sounds like a bit of an urban design issue that, that if the back is more attractive than the front, maybe maybe you want to reverse that. I mean, if, uh, having a really lively public realm, having a, an exciting street, having more things happening on the street, uh, and having the street read as the front entrance to the retailers is something you may have to accomplish through to planning and design requirements. Well, it, it also sounds as though it's everybody's sort of parking behind to make certain that the access from the parking lot up to the front is is something that people feel safe rather than just going directly into the building. They can walk around. Um, and if the streetscape is designed well, leading from that parking lot or parking garage around into the front of the buildings. I mean, really encourage people just to, to park and, and get out and walk to go to the, the front of the stores. I mean, yeah. That's a good point. We have a couple smaller retail districts that have created their parking behind, uh, you know, away from the street on the other side of the building, and, and I think that they have done that. They have been able to find ways to get them out onto the street to enter the, yeah. the shops. Okay, our next question um, 
is from Deborah. How has the increase in online shopping impacted urban retail markets? Um, I'm sorry, I can't quantify it. Um, I think it's I think it's going to affect uh, urban markets an awful lot. Um, I think online book sales have killed bookstores. Um, what do we have? One major, two major uh, national booksellers left. Um, on the other hand, you can't, you know, you, the, the experience of handling a book is still an experience that people like. And I think the biggest challenge uh, on, on retail sales are, are uh, not the online sale of beer, but the online sale of something you buy and take home. Um, and so keeping uh, actual stores in these retail districts is going to be an ever-increasing challenge because you can buy virtually everything online. We've been very successful in the Clarendon area by bringing, uh, doing some market studies, showing what the demographics were, showing that there was a real gap in home furnishings and, and, and similar types of, of sales, and then attracting a pottery barn, a crate and barrel, and a couple of other stores, the kind of container store that meet that type of niche. Um, but I, I, I I don't know that I think there's a universal answer to online retailing. I think it will it will affect things differently. You have to understand, I mean, what we found is that retail is constantly changing. So you can't you can't lock into anything. Uh, you know, um, video stores were really big ten years ago um, and uh, they don't they don't hardly exist at all anymore in most communities. Uh, so that's just gone. And yet we had a use the other day that's not even in our zoning code which is telephone stores, um, at which now seem to be in a lot of different locations. Uh, I remember uh, I always viewed it as you call the phone company and they come over and install a phone. Um, well, that doesn't happen anymore. Video stores are now competitive retailers. And, and so retail, retail changes constantly and trying to figure out what the next niche is going to be and, and, and somehow being, uh, being able to articulate that. We spend a fair amount of effort doing demographic analysis and psychodemographics that can make arguments to various retailers or why they need to be in our community. That seems to have helped a little bit. But if you know if a particular segment is getting crushed by the internet, not much you can do about it. Okay, um, our next question is from Francis. As some groups are calling for less of a governmental role in funding transit, does not that does not pay for itself. Um, do you see potential problems with so much invested in a transit corridor? Well, our experience was a little different. We we had a decaying commercial corridor that you saw some of the pictures of how how decimated it was, and and we we spent three hundred million dollars to um, to reroute the metro system uh, down this decaying commercial corridor in a year when our entire county budget was $200 million. And we said, okay, we, we understand there's going to be an upside. It's going to take 30 years to get there. Uh, we did some of the math on it, and we, we bet the farm that, that, that hard rail metro um, was, in fact, the answer, at least for that particular area. And it has paid off beyond anybody's projections. Um, even when it's a little more marginal, like it's going to be on, uh, on Columbia Pike, where I'm not so sure that you could say it will pay for itself in terms of the actual funding of the project. Um, ultimately, the vision of the area is going to make it a much more functional type of area. And so we have had to institute a, a countywide kind of add-on special district that basically uh, creates a fund that helps pay for some of the transit, the, the non-metro related transit. Uh, so we're huge transit believers. We, we you know, salute the transit flag every day. Um, I don't know that it's a, a cure-all for everything, but clearly Arlington is, is totally focused on transit-oriented development. And if you want to contact us, we can try to help you with the math a little bit. Uh, again, not saying it works everywhere, but it clearly has worked for us. We're able to make some economic arguments about why it worked. Okay, our next question is from Jason. Um, he says that his community has issues with the downtown retail developer, which is located under a city-built parking garage, um, and that they're holding out for a more higher-end, nationally known retailer. Uh, but the space has been vacant for a few, year, for a few years now and is stunting growth. Um, you mentioned 
uh, locally owned retail versus national national chains. Have you had issues with developers holding out like that, or? Well, you know, everybody wants a credit worthy tenant, and yet if you talk to to the more talented retail brokers, they will tell you that some local businesses are as credit worthy or more than some of the national chains and franchises. So I, I think you you, you need a a willingness to really look at the credit worthiness of the tenant and the building or business plan uh, for who they might be. But it, it's often hard to get funding for a major project without tenants of significant size. And so that may actually be a very realistic uh, market uh, issue for, for a larger scale development. Uh, not knowing the context, it's hard to answer, but uh, I think uh, getting a willingness to kind of look at at the at the tenant credit credit worthiness is worthwhile and the other idea is some some interim uses if you've got a use that is not our building that's not being used it's only deteriorating and it will deteriorate a lot more slowly if you have an interim use in there even if it's not a credit worthy type of use um, and, and so I, I always advise people never let a space really be empty for very long um, and find an interim or temporary use for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I would encourage you, even if you could have the discussion and, and see if the, the developer would be willing to, to be able to use the space sort of as a temporary use. Is there an ability to have a gallery there? Is there an ability to use it for something, at least temporarily? It gets people in and out, um, and it sort of helps the area itself. OK, our next question is from Maureen. Um, as you consider policies and regulations, have you fielded requests for relaxed noise ordinances, especially for like live music and outdoor patios at restaurants and pubs? And like, how do you handle it? Uh, Jill used to do use permits yeah. for it. So. Um, su surprisingly not. It, it really hasn't come up. We, we, there really hasn't been any change to our, to our noise ordinance. Um, as I mentioned in going through our Applies, our, our one urban village, Clarendon, is, is really seen as a, a live entertainment area. Um, and along one of the streets, you know, there are bars and restaurants that, that do abut single family residential uh, development. I think what we've done is really worked with the sort of these restaurants and, and venues to have them recognize that what context that they're in. Uh, we want them to be successful, but we also want the neighborhood as a whole to be successful. And we've done a lot of work working with the community um, businesses to make sure that there's there's respect. And it includes you know making sure that if music is being played or there's any live entertainment, that doors are closed, windows are closed. Um, there is the sound attenuation that, that, that is achieved. And, and that they ask their patrons as they're leaving, and we encourage them to, to ask their patrons to, to recognize they're, they're walking into a, a residential area and, and to, to try to lower their voices. So we've had one instance that came up recently, and it was a question about music being played outside. And um, in this instance, it was a restaurant that was located below um, condo units. And you know, there, there was discussion back and forth, but I think it was ultimately determined that having that use is, is part of the urban fabric. Um, it's part of what we see here, um, so that if a person goes inside, that they're not hearing it necessarily from their inside. They might hear it a little bit from their balcony. But then to be respectful and make sure it's being turned off at an appropriate hour. But I think we put a lot of conditions um, rather than specifics in our noise ordinance. It would be nice to think the noise ordinance handles it all, but as we, as we do live entertainment permitting specifically, oftentimes we will get into some negotiated agreements relative to the hours uh, that the uh, music must uh, stop in terms of outdoor speakers and uh, sometimes the uh, uh, additional tests are actually kind of written into the uh, into the agreements that you can't hear it from, you know, Mrs. Smith's fourth floor condo unit as the as the planning and zoning 
swing test. We hate to see that happen, but, but sometimes you know we've kind of been forced into it. Oftentimes, or not not often, but, but occasionally you will get the person who buys a condominium right in the middle of the entertainment district, and then it's oh my God, there's noise here. Um, and we respectfully suggest that they find a suitable suburban location for the residents. Uh, that doesn't always go over very big, but some, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be a, a resident in an entertainment district, you're gonna have to understand that the the needs of the entertainment district actually were there before you were. All right, so. Um Lenore um, is asking, how do you regulate the sexually oriented retail uses, such as the adult video stores or live entertainment, that has more of a sexually explicit program without infringing on the constitutional rights to freedom of expression? I think we would refer you to the city of Alexandria, which has a lot more experience with this than we do, because I don't think we've ever, ever really kind of dealt with it very much. Um, it's not been an issue in our community. There was a retailer in our adjacent community of Alexandria that got turned down for an entertainment permit. So it did a, an adult sex toy store as a spite business um, and caused the city all kinds of consternation about how to deal with it. But um, uh, I said I, we don't have much experience with it, but I suspect that the planning uh, department in the city of Alexandria could, could help you out there. Okay, um, we'll try to get through um, one two more questions. Um, so Leslie asked, have you established modified landscape requirements in retail areas? Like the right choice of a tree can retain plantings while preserving visibility and there are um, tree varieties that they specify for village type areas. Do you guys do anything like that? We have... The landscape plans, and typically these are done as, as part of a, a larger, of a site plan development, so a special exception that's done. And working more closely with the architects and the landscape architects with respect to tree placement um, and tree selection. Um, in, in our policies and our guidelines, you know, the, the streetscape standards that we have, it, it does provide for a couple of different types of trees and, and recognizing that certain trees are a little bit better and can be limbed up a little bit more readily. Um, but I think also working the, with the landscape architect, working with the architect as part of the team, recognizing where the entrances are going to be, where the storefronts are going to be, uh, and making certain that the, the street trees are designed, you know, they're, it's more of a, it's uniform, but it's not, uh, right, necessarily the window that's needed, or for in front of the door, you know, sort of a rhythm and pattern. But but working between the two, uh, both the landscape architect and the landscape, and excuse me, and the architect in in developing that that street space. Well, you you want trees that are hardy enough to survive. You've got to have you know standards that have tree pits sufficient to allow them to do so. You want varieties that are appropriate for the the local environment, and then you have all these urban design considerations along with them. So it, it can be difficult, but we try to we try to have a reasonable amount of flexibility and common sense as we go through the development entitlement process. Okay, and then our last question is from Alex. What are some of the best quick slash cheap sources of psychographic data for your community? I think Esri is probably the easiest and least expensive source, um, and I think that's where we get most of our data, um, ESRI. Uh, there's there's a couple of other sources where you can get a little bit more detailed data and maybe even um, uh, some other things you can't get out of Esri, but Esri is, you know, it's, it fits with GIS system, so you can get it in almost any geography. Um, and it's relatively inexpensive. So I would say start there. All right. Um, we are getting ready to run out of time, so um, I believe that includes our question and answer session. And so I just want to thank both you, Terry and Jill, um, for today's presentation. Um, well, thank for you very much, Jody, and thanks for all, all of those people or whoever has left as we, uh, as we close it out. Yes. 
And so for those of you still in attendance, I'm just going to go through on um, logging SIEM credits um, with you. So after the presentation, you can go to www.planning.org slash SAM, select activities by date, and then underneath March 11th, you'll see urban retail, so you can go ahead and uh, claim those credits. And then, like I said before, we are recording today's session, so you'll be able to find a video recording and a PDF of today's webinar at www.utah-apa.org slash webcast dash archive. And this should be up um, by Monday. So again, I just want to thank all of you for participating today, and another thank you um, to Terry and Joe for giving today's presentation.